following is a production of DallasCowboys.com and the Dallas Cowboys Football Club. How about this, Cowboys? Yeah! This, this is Talkin' Cowboys. Streaming live from the Dallas Cowboys World Headquarters at the Star in Frisco. First down. Hand off, Elliott plowing to the goal line. Barry, sacked by Lord. Prescott keeps it, and he bangs it into the touchdown. It's another Tuesday edition of Talking Cowboys here on DallasCowboys.com as we sift through the entirety of this Dallas Cowboys offseason and what has been a crazy offseason for the Dallas Cowboys. And we are going to continue to do our best to break it down for you as we near the 2020, hopefully, training camp coming up in late July. Once again, the Talking Cowboys crew, Rob Phillips, Heckma Harrison, Isaiah Stanback, our resident Super Bowl champion, and myself, Kyle Yeomans, all socially distant from our respective SWBC Mortgage Studios. And guys, i got to tell you, I feel like we get the short end of the stick every now and again. It, whenever it comes to the timing of our show being on Tuesdays, I love the Tuesday slot, but it always seems like the the top storylines and the fun things with the Cowboys this offseason happen either Tuesday afternoon, right. Wednesday, or Thursday. Because last week, it was really kind of quiet leading up into Tuesday, and then Tuesday afternoon, all of a sudden... Alden Smith is reinstated, and now the Cowboys have uh, a little bit more depth at that right defensive end spot. <laughs> yeah, we can clap for that. Yeah, we've got Alden Smith back. But then yes. you've got the Jamal Adams fun that happens later in the week. But, heck, man, we're kind of on the short end here in terms of the timing of us talking about this stuff. Isn't that jacked up, man? I feel the same way. I mean, we have got to get in the news cycle that happens before Tuesday. So we have something to talk about, uh, but everybody else kind of. But by the time it gets to us, you know, we're still muddy in the water and we're dragging that same topic. But at the same time, we make it so fun and look so good. Ooh, I like that. And it sounds so good because we've got guys like Rob Phillips on the line as well. Because, Rob, I mean. You were pretty quick on that Alden Smith news last week, and we even kind of alluded to it going into the deal. Yeah, and you know what? It, it's a situation where the Cowboys had to wait for the NFL's timing to get it done. I, I don't think the Cowboys really knew when it was going to happen or for sure it was going to happen because it just comes down to what Roger Goodell wants to do and his discretion. But I heard some applause from somebody on the crew, and that's well-founded because this is a guy – that has 47 and a half sacks in 59 career games. And I don't think they're asking him to be a 19 and a half sack guy like he was in San Francisco. Just just moneyball this thing. You know the movie with Brad Pitt just helped piece together what Robert Quinn did for them last season. And that's kind of the key, is to have a guy like Alden Smith come in and not necessarily be an all-pro. You're not going to get that same type of player like he was in San Francisco, as Rob just alluded to. You're going to have to have somebody who's going to be a part of, of a team and, and bring some experience, be, bring some leadership into that locker room. And Isaiah, you're the one that's been in a locker room like that. What's it like maybe playing with a player or knowing that a guy has taken some time off, at least gotten a broad view of football and being able to bring that into his game? Yeah, I think he's going to be coming in. Obviously, he's going to be free. You know, that's that's number one. He's going to get, <laughs> he said, man, has had a lot of time. He got, as we like to say, he has fresh legs. You know, so we got a pair of fresh legs coming in the locker room. I think with his pass, I think he'll probably come in and be a lot more mute than he than you probably typically would from a vet. Uh, so he'll come in because he knows he has to reestablish himself as a player and he has to reestablish himself as a leader, um, especially in a new locker room. So I think he, you know, he'll come in. He come in with all that experience, and I think it's going to be a great thing. But you know, then he'll probably just be quiet and, and just let this gameplay uh, you know show show itself As, hey I, I want to make sure that I piggyback off of what you just said Isaiah because I feel the same way uh, about Alden Smith I think there's this what if associated with him and also Randy Gregory and the you know being reinstated but yeah. I know for a lot of people there is the five-year layoff and people just wondering how effective is Alden Smith going to be for me 
I just feel like that five years, yeah, he's going to be a little rusty, but for the position that he plays, it's not going to be as much of a lag as most people are thinking. I think if he played a, a, a skill position like maybe receiver or running back uh, or even DB, uh, that five-year layoff may, you know, may have affected his game. Again, I'm not expecting him to come back and maybe be, and I wish, I hope, he's a double-digit <laughs> sack guy. But at the same time, I just think him being effective and also looking at Randy Gregory as well, uh, yeah. going into the fold. Guys, I, I, I just have a lot of hope for this position because I feel as though uh, we are going to have a great opportunity uh, with Alden Smith uh, in this defense. And we'll get into that right defensive spot, uh, defensive end spot, rather, a little bit later on in the show. Now, this is going to be a fun show. We're talking about a lot of the trouble spots of the Dallas Cowboys. We're going to answer a lot of your questions, the defensive line, tight end uh, position, and also the cornerbacks. We're going to go through all three of those positions in depth over the course of the next hour. So stick around because we've got plenty of stuff to, to go along with. But sticking with this defensive line, last week we kind of compared – Tank Lawrence as one of those guys, Demarcus Lawrence, as the leader on that defense. Somebody that needs to step up after having a little bit of a down year. Now he was coming off of shoulder surgery, kind of got off to a slow start, only had single-digit sacks. Can he get back to that double-digit sack? Sure, that's I'm sure that's on the, the docket for Tank Lawrence. But, Rob, I kind of want to ask about just the factor of him being a leader with a lot of these younger guys and veterans all kind of meshing together. Neville Gallimore, Don Terry Poe, you got Jerry McCoy that's now in the middle of that defensive line, Bradley and I on the other side. What kind of role is Tank Lawrence going to have in terms of bringing those two groups together? Well, that's a great point. I think he's got to be more of that vocal guy. Uh, on the defensive side of the ball. And I think that was kind of a new role for him last year. I think they, they, they put that on him to be more of that locker room presence. Um, mm-hmm. I, I think talking to him last year, I think from a production standpoint for him, one of the issues he had was the time he missed coming off the surgery in training camp. And, and I, I, one thing for him was the technical side of things, just yeah. working on his, on his moves, his counters. Uh, he just I don't know if his timing was – what it normally is and it took him a few weeks to get going on it i know he faces double teams and and the guy's effort down after down is so good that i think his production you really have to watch the tape back to see what he does beyond just what the sacks are uh but but to your point yes he's a vocal guy but or needs to be but another guy that they need to get back for two reasons. On the field, off the field, is Tyrone Crawford. Tyrone Crawford. Because yeah. that, is, that is a guy that, that DeMarcus has leaned on for years. Mm-hmm. And I, he can be so valuable to them in terms of giving them reps at a couple different spots, but also bringing along those younger guys, like you said. You did it again, Rob. <laughs> <laughs> hey, great minds think alike. I'm trying to tell you. It, it, uh, I, you know, like you said, it's, it's true. I mean, that, that was a big void left in, as far as the leadership uh, on the defensive line. And I think Tank Lawrence, again, to your point, Rob had to fill those shoes. But, guys, don't fool yourself. I mean, most offensive coordinators have to identify where – Tank Lawrence is because he is a game plan wrecker. Uh, if you look at last season, you know, teams were not just leaving him by himself on an island. They were chipping him, double teaming him, and they're going to have to do the same thing this year. But the difference is, is that you have a guy Don Terry Poe that is also going to have to be double teamed as well. And so, if you relegate or just say, hey, I'm just going to have my center be on Don Terry Poe by himself, it's going to be a long night for whoever <laughs> that, that person is because Don Terry Poe is a big human person. He's big. And so you have I like to, that. Oh, he's a big human person. <laughs> he is, he, he, you, have to double, you have to double team him. But that also leads me to Gerald McCoy. Gerald McCoy, once upon a time, was a bad man in this league. And people said his they put some respect on his name when they talked about (laughs) Gerald McCoy. And now, I mean, and like most things that happen with, you know, contracts, guys, he ended up leaving Tampa because of his his contract and went to play uh, in Carolina. And if you look at that tape from last year in Carolina, I mean, that team was getting their doors blown off. But still, Gerald McCoy was one of the guys that was still giving it giving it to that team, whistle to whistle. And so for him, I know that, yeah, he's a serviceable guy at this point, but he comes in with a chip on his shoulder and he's going to have plenty of opportunity to show everyone what he has left in the tank because he's going to have a one-on-one uh, matchup and he's going to have to beat it. 
Y'all yeah. killed it, man. I mean, D D Law is gonna do what D Law does, you know. And now he just has a he has a partner with him, right? Uh, obviously, we want Crawford to come back. We want him to come back healthy um, and ready to roll, uh, take care of business as that vet, as that voice, um, uh, you know, on that defensive line. But you just got Alden Smith back. You just got Smith back off a of suspension, and this dude paired up with Law is going to be a serious problem. Yes. You guys, I mean, I don't know how much people out there, Cowboys Nation, y'all need to recognize that this D line is about to be what I what I like to call McNasty. Okay, y'all y'all, y'all need to recognize this is about to be serious because as Heck just appointed, just attested to, you got two dogs in the middle. You cannot ISO these guys in the middle. You have to. You have one of those guys is going to have one on one, one of them, right? So you pick your poison, McCoy or Poe. Either way, it's going to be an L, all right? And then you got you have opportunity to put those other dogs to go eat on the outside. I am really looking forward to seeing these guys get after the ball and quarterback. I think they're going to have a heck of a time. And I really, honestly, whole, uh, truly believe that they're going to have a, a, a two-line rotation and keep these guys fresh. I think we'll get the title of the show once this is over. McNasty. McNasty. <laughs> I love that. I, I See, but I'm, I want to kind of look from a, a – Maybe a skeptical perspective here. I want to throw a wrench into things because on paper it looks great. You've got these these big names, Gerald McCoy, like uh, Heckman was saying earlier. Hey, he's a he's he's a name that people recognize. He was a household name early in his career. He's still on the backside of his career. Same thing for Don Tari Poe. You can maybe even say the same thing for Tyrone Crawford at the same point. So right. all of these names are great, but is this defensive line? certainly better than it was last year because I I just want to hear what you think because yes you've added those guys but you also lost Robert Quinn who's a double double sack guy or a double digit sack guy you have Malik Collins that's now gone and up to uh, Las Vegas almost said Oakland there but Las Vegas so what why is this defense so much stop better it, man stop it we come on tell me why Isaiah pros tell me why on the D line man we talking about all pro <laughs> goons when you turn the film on and you got dudes sitting in the film room you circle mm-hmm. those two dogs in the middle and then you circle them guys on the outside and said these guys are going to eat who are you going to stop if you want to if you want to try to run the ball good luck try to move all that man in the middle all right if you want to try to pass the ball them dudes are going to put their ears back and they're coming. And matter of fact, and guess what? Even if you want to try to play it safe, you still got three dogs sitting right behind those guys. And, and Lee, Vander Esch, and Smith. So listen, mm-hmm. this front seven is 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 sick. I can't wait. You talk. I know you're talking about the last year's guys. Respect to them. Thank you guys for doing what you do. But this, we have, we have. <laughs> hey, just like just like Beyonce said, let me upgrade you. That's what just happened. <laughs> and that's what we. And that's exactly what we got, uh, Isaiah. We got. We got upgraded. But, Kyle, let me tell you this, man. In 2020, man, nobody likes the devil's advocate, all right? And that's what you love <laughs> that's to play. That's okay. Somebody's going to play that role. And, I, I and have to ask the and, questions. And that's you. You're trying to prove it. me wrong. <laughs> I love it. Um, you know, and, and, and I think that you have to look at what we have behind it. Neville Gallimore is going to be a killer. I just believe mm-hmm. that he is going to be a spark plug for this defensive line and yeah. the fact that Coach Tom Sula has talked heavily uh, in interviews about – having guys in rotation and so look I, I, last year's team last year's defensive line and, and we talked about Lord this no. a little bit last week it's these guys were a lot smaller than the guys that you have mm-hmm. and so they had their their skill set was one of having to be quick get out the way and get up the field uh these guys present a different challenge because look man when you have a guy like Don Terry Poe that's in again getting that double team it's really hard for the the guard to release off on those linebackers and if you reach we teach right and so defensively (laughs) that's the thing that I believe that's going to be that's the upgrade right that's the upgrade in the defense because you have guys that are going to be there and they're going to be solid uh in the middle of our defense and and, and just just to backdoor what you just said heck I want everybody out there in Cowboys Nation to, to imagine I don't want you guys to imagine that you guys are a starting center for whatever team. I don't care. Let's call it the Giants, <laughs> right? You're a starting center. You got an all pro dude sitting in the A gap by the name of McCoy, right? Sitting right there. Even if he's head up on your on your guard, he's right there, all right, next to you. And then you have this dude named Poe who just happens to be eh, maybe 340 pounds, okay? And he's no he's not only is he in the gap, but he is angled with his helmet lined up directly at your shoulder. Right. So as soon as you snap the ball, as soon as he sees that ball move, he is putting both hands on one of your shoulders and he is going one direction. Yeah. That proposes a problem. And that is what you guys can look forward to seeing. 
Uh, Isaiah, yeah, I do. I'll, I'll play. Go ahead. Uh, go, I was going to just go back real quickly off of what Isaiah said, but you said all pro Gerald McCoy. Are you think he's going to be an all pro this year? Or are you saying in 2013 he was an all pro? Because, I, I mean, I don't know if he's going to be an all pro as a Dallas Cowboy. He's on the back end of his career. I think he's an upgrade based off of what they've had in the past, just based off of the size, the speed, yeah. the athleticism, which is still better than I think maybe an Antoine Woods or a Malik Collins. I, I think like he's that. an upgrade. I think he is. I just don't think he's going to be an All-Pro. I don't know if we can tap him as a 2020 All-Pro. 2013, 2014, he was a household name. I just don't think that's the case. So... So in the, so in the locker room, let me go ahead and give you guys a little uh, a look behind the veil, okay? In the locker room, once you're an all pro, you're all pro. That's your name. I like you're, that. You're, you're, you're title. You got. It's on your resume. It's on your resume. There is no question <laughs> yeah. about it. I don't care if you were all pro your first year and you're in year twenty. You're still all pro. All right. So to answer your question, though, in terms of him being able to make it this year, I honestly see this Cowboys defense having five to six all pro players on this defense this wow. year. Yeah. Wow. wow. Yeah. Wow. I said That's it. a bold I statement, sir. What? I did. I said it. That's right. I'm going to write that down really quickly. That just put it so down. Have that. Hot take. <laughs> take it. Put it on there. Put it on there. I think we have a real opportunity with this group that they put together, with this defensive coordinator that they have. These guys are going to be in position to make a lot of plays that they wouldn't have been in before. Hmm. That's, that's the key right there that I think you just nailed because the scheme has to. Yep set the players up and that's mm-hmm. why they made a change because I think I think with the last regime a lot of it was this is what we do and we're, we're not going to do a lot of pre-snap disguising and we're just going to try to beat you at the snap at yeah. the snap yeah. and and I think yeah I think they're going to try to scheme things up a little bit more but Kyle I'll play devil's advocate with you a little bit I know uh, I like, like it this. <laughs> heck Thank I know you, you don't like it <laughs> first good. of all I'll say they they are I think they are upgraded in the middle of the defensive line. I do think yes. so. If you don't but I did I did get curious and I went back and I was trying to figure out why Carolina with Don Terry Poe and Gerald McCoy were 29th against the run last year. Mm-hmm. I mean that that I, you know you just look at the stats and you're like, "Wow, what what happened there?" Happened. And, and I'll tell you what, man, it was it was a lot like it sounded like it was a lot like what happened with the Cowboys last year. You had guys Kind of playing out of position at times, not te- technical sound, trying to make tackles, and they were a, they were a gap control defense that didn't always fill the gaps properly. I don't know if you can put that all on Don Terry Poe and, and Gerald McCoy, but they were part of a defense that didn't have success last year. And I, I think you know they, they lost some guys, they shifted some guys around. Kwan Short wasn't there, so I, I know that's a devil devil's advocate type of thinking. Is well, what happened yeah. to that group last year? I don't think you can put it all on them. But, man, they, they do need those two guys to be rock solid against the run because I said it last week, when this defense does not stop the run, they have problems. They have big problems that kind of leaks out to the rest of the group. And I'm glad that earlier in this segment, Heckma brought up Neville Gallimore because I think on the back end of Gerald McCoy and Dontari Poe, you've got a young gun that could end yeah. up being an all-pro as a Dallas Cowboy because he is going to be maybe a surprise. He was a value pick in the third round. Whenever he fell to you at 82, that was when you were high-fiving those around you because you knew (laughs) he was going to have a star on the side of his helmet. And, heck, I know you brought him up, but what kind of role does he have to play? And and while we're talking about rookies on the defensive line, you've got a couple at the end spots too, Bradley and I, who was a draft pick. And then also you got Ladarius Hamilton and uh, the James Madison, uh, Rondell Carter, who also was an undrafted free agent. You've got a heavy room of rookies on that defensive line. Yeah. Absolutely. I, I believe that you had the first question about Navel uh, Gallimore, I think this kid can come in and play freely because he has uh, so much of a presence in, front uh, in the league. And so I think that it's important for him uh, to get into that rotation. But there's a name that we keep forgetting to mention, and that's Tristan Hill. This is mm-hmm. a guy in his second year uh, that also will benefit by having these guys in front of him and teaching him the ropes. Uh, and not that they didn't last year. I just feel as though it's gonna be he's going to have a better room. Uh, but also, again, the right end, we, we put a lot of uh, that concentration on what are we going to do, what are we going to do. Guys, the guy, the, the guy that may start at your right end position may not even be on your roster right now. So yeah. that, that, that may be another thing for you to have to, you know, put in your pipe and smoke and understand that, look, there are a lot of changes yet to still be made. But I believe 
Neville Gallimore, Hill, and also Antoine Woods will may play uh, a large role in your defensive line rotation, mm-hmm. but also a name that we have to remember as far as the right edge, and that's a nine, uh, yep. the rookie. He's going to make. He is going to be thrust into this defense and put in a position to excel. Also, I think that he has a special skill set, and he's a hunter. If you go back, yeah, and buddy, the team, you understand that this kid is all about you know aggression and coming after the quarterback. I look for this Cowboys defense to have a lot of fire and also be able to have that rotation where there's not a fall off when they bring in that second that second group. Yep. When, when you're when you're a young player and you got some you have some vets in front of you that are that are you know highly touted guys, your job is to simply come in and bring energy. That's that's your role. Your role is to come in, not mess anything up. <laughs> <laughs> First of all, come in, be where you're supposed to be, do what you're supposed to do, and do it at 100 miles per hour, right? And yeah. give me give me one or two plays and, and get out of there, right? And, and let me come in, right? And learn the tempo of the game, learn the pace of the game. Watch, right? Watch those reps. You know what I'm mm-hmm. saying? When you have opportunity to rotate in, you're playing against you're playing against the starting five O line. They they don't they don't sub out, right? So you're playing against the best that every team has when you come in, right? You might be the second best of what you're uh, on your team, but you're playing against the best that the other t- opposing team has. So it is very important for those guys to just learn what they're learn what they're supposed to do. Come out and just give it 100 percent because literally that's all the expectation is of you. Just don't mess up and give me all the energy you have. I thought, heck, you brought up a good point about Antoine Woods. Uh, you know, it's a guy that's dealt with a lot of injuries off and on the last couple of years. That maybe playing fewer snaps will allow him to be fresher and, and, and more productive. But I, I agree with what you guys are saying. And, you know, I'm excited to see the Canadian bulldozer, man, Neville Gallimore. I think that yeah. guy, he's, for his size, that is an athletic up the field. Yeah. Rush Amazing from the middle yeah. of the line. I mean, I, I think that's, that's actually a guy that was in consideration at 58. So to get him at 82, they, they are really happy about that. And they also yeah. think he might be – there's room to grow. Coming from Canada, not playing at a high level of football early in his career, they think he's got you know some more upside to go. He's definitely got some upside. And it's kind of tough talking about a rookie class like we have been, talking about CeeDee Lamb, Trayvon Diggs, Neville Gallimore all making an impact as a rookie. It's, it's more likely that not all three of those guys have – a phenomenal rookie season. If they do, then all of a sudden you're having an incredible year as an organization. It's it's a little bit too early to tap the brakes, but I think at the same time you got to keep that in the back of your head. They are rookies. Hopefully they do make the impact that we expect, but uh, it's still tough to, to kind of tab that pressure on them immediately. Now, the Cowboys have officially moved on from Jason Witten earlier this offseason. They did so by turning the page with a four-year, $22 million deal to Blake Jarwin. Mm. When we come back here on Talking Cowboys, we're going to tell you how Blake Jarwin can be one of the best pieces of this 2020 offense, despite all the storylines being about around those wide receivers. We'll be back in a moment here on Talking Cowboys. I'm Jay Novacek, former tight end for the Dallas Cowboys. Back in the day, I was the guy who always got the tough yards, and that's why I run with John Deere today. In fact, I have a John Deere 3025E tractor that can handle any yard work I need to do, even the tough yards way out back. So if you have one acre or a thousand, John Deere has the equipment that's just right for you. Visit a John Deere dealer today and run with us. We are the official tractor provider of your Dallas Cowboys. Essilor is a proud sponsor of the Dallas Cowboys, helping fans see more and do more with our best vision solutions. Our lens technologies reveal a world more beautiful than you can imagine. For a limited time, get the Essilor Next Gen offer. When you buy the latest generation of Transitions lenses with select Essilor lenses, you can choose a second pair of clear lenses for free with qualifying frame purchases. Restrictions apply. Find a participating eye care professional by visiting EssilorUSA.com. Essilor. See more. Do more. Want to use what the pros use? How about the official men's skincare brand of the Dallas Cowboys, Jack Black? Right now, you can get the Jack Black Starter, a curated collection of Cowboys locker room favorites for just 10 bucks with free shipping. The starter includes four Jack Black skincare favorites plus a full-sized intense therapy lip balm. Go to getjackblack.com slash cowboys and use the code word TEAMJB. That's getjackblack.com slash cowboys. The Jack Black Starter, 10 bucks. Free shipping! Your new apartment's big. Such a great deal. Uh, it's okay. Just okay? What's not too... 
right above the subway. Well, I bet you don't even notice it after the... That's my neighbor, Angus. A deal that's just okay is not okay. Get a great deal with America's Best Network. Come into an AT&T store to find out how to get one of our popular smartphones for $0 down. Based on GWS1 score September 2019. Back to Talking Cowboys. Don't miss your Dallas Cowboys this season at AT&T Stadium. Single game tickets are on sale now. Get your tickets today at DallasCowboys.com. You can go online and get all your tickets for... What is a jam-packed schedule at AT AT&T Stadium this upcoming season? Back here for segment number two on Talking Cowboys. Rob Phillips, Isaiah Stanback, the great Heckma Harrison. I'm Kyle Yeomans. And, guys, this past segment we talked about one of the trouble spots for the Dallas Cowboys, at least going into the offseason, which was the defensive line. Seemingly they made an improvement there. Now we take a look at the tight end spot. And, Last season was the return of Jason Witten after a one-year hiatus in the Monday Night Football booth. He makes his way back, catches a touchdown pass in each of the first two games. And then from there, it kind of just kind of pittered-pattered throughout the rest of the season. He has now moved on. He has gone to Las Vegas to be a part of John Gruden's Raiders. Now (laughs) it's Blake Jarwin's turn to be tight end number one. Four years, $22 million deal. Mm. And, guys, my question is, what kind of jump can we expect from Blake Jarwin, Rob, because last year he kind of was back into that tight end two slot. Now he's got a chance to really improve and really take off. Well, I I would hope, I would think they would hope he could, you know, maybe double his production for Mm. a guy that's played, you know, maybe 30% of the snaps. I think he might've been under that a little bit last year uh, to being the guy, as you said. And there's parts of his game that he needs to work on or, you know, the, the blocking part of it he's not necessarily known for as much. That's yeah. something Witten was good even late in his career as a blocker. But I think we know what he's good at. What, he, what he's really good at is stretching the field, um, being a down-the-field vertical threat from the tight end spot. And I kind of liken this a little bit to, and I'm not comparing the two players, but I kind of liken it to when Miles Austin took over as the starting wide receiver here after you know a couple years of being a reserve. And it, there's a difference between playing a few snaps a game and having a few targets a game to being the guy that everybody's game planning for. And to me, that's what I'm looking for the most is how he handles defenses gunning for him this year because he's been kind of a spot player and now he's going to be the featured guy. And Miles was able to make that transition because he played behind guys like T.O., and Roy Williams that taught him how to prepare. And I think he learned that from Jason Witten. I think he's going to be fine, but but it is going to be an adjustment for him. Heckman? Okay. Um, you know, look, I, I feel like this, when, when it comes down to Blake Jarwin, it's it's the gift and the curse of, curse of having Jason Witten, playing behind Jason Witten. And the gift is, is that you get the consummate pro show you how to prepare, uh, like Rob just alluded to. But at the same time, you know, what is the mind state of, of Blake Jarwin? I mean, last mm-hmm. year, well, two years ago, uh, Witten retired, and he was basically given the keys to the tight end room, and then, oh, okay, Jason's back, <laughs> right? And so now, you, now you're now you playing the role of number two behind, look, all pro, one of the better receivers to ever play the game, of football, one of the better tight ends to ever play the game of football. And so checking the mind state also of Blake Jarwin is important. I, I think that he's had a ample opportunity uh, to to be the guy uh, at tight end, but also with Blake Bell. I think, and I've said this before, I think it's the combination of, of them both together that's going to be that one tight end. And also, mm-hmm. guys, the un, uh, the undrafted uh, free agent we got uh, from Michigan, McKean, uh, the mm-hmm. guy that, you know, from Michigan who played in Jim Harbaugh and Harbaugh's offense. I like this kid. I think he's a, you know, pretty stir- sturdy blocker, but also a great receiver. Uh, so, look, we had, as far as Blake Jarwin, I know the question was about him. I, I think, obviously, that he's going to make that, that jump. But there are just some things, if I'm playing the devil's advocate, guys, I think that he has some things in his game as far as blocking is concerned that makes you worry. Well, last Go year ahead. he was 65th of 69 tight ends on pro football focus in his run blocking grade. 65th of 69, Isaiah. That's not necessarily the uh, the rating you would want. 
It's not the rating you want, but like you guys attested to, you know, he had that dude in front of him named Jason Witten. He didn't have to be the great blocker, right? So he played his position last year. This year he got cashed out. All right, so he is going to be expected. There's a level of excellence that is now comes with his name. So he's going to have to figure that out. And, yes, run blocking will be a part of it because they can't just sub Blake in every time they want to block. Right? No, they, that's going to tip your so, hand for real. So he's going he's gonna to learn. He's going to have to learn how to be that guy that can move the dog, move some men off the ball. And it might be rough for him, especially not having OTAs. That sucks. Right, so he's gonna have to figure that out. He's got to figure it out quick because they are going to come out with him in the game. They're gonna have a dude by the name of Ezekiel Elliott behind him, and Freaky Zeke is gonna expect that dude to move some men off the ball because they just paid him a lot of money. So he's got he, he he'll, he'll figure that out in terms of expectation in the passing game. I think he has to improve upon his route running. Yeah, we know that he has a juice and he can get downfield. But listen, we got three dudes on the um, out there a receiver now that have juice. So do we really need somebody that can stretch the field from the inside position? No, we really need somebody who can get open underneath. So he's gonna have to work on that aspect of his game because I think that his role um, and what he's what he considers you know himself confident in and in an in, in area that he excels in, he's gonna have to then tipple that down and, and focus his attention. On, on being a typical tight end who works at anywhere from 5 to 12 yards. And that's one thing that Jason Witten always provided Dak Prescott. Yeah, buddy. Even up toward the end of his career was a reliable target underneath that if Dak Prescott got in trouble and he had to get flushed yeah. out of the pocket or he was under pressure, he could dump it off and he knew that 82 was within reach. Yeah. That's something that maybe doesn't fit necessarily into the breadbasket of what Blake Jarwin brings to the table as a tight end. But, Isaiah, you made a point a little bit ago of him being behind Jason Witten, not having to be that run blocker, even though his grade was very low. It was interesting, the disbursement of snaps that Blake Jarwin had last year. I went back and looked at it. Right at the beginning of the year, they were pretty even between pass blocking snaps and run blocking. But as you went along and the season continued, his run blocking snaps started to shrink considerably to the point where he still had more run blocking snaps by the end of the season, just not as much as he did really at the beginning of the year whenever they were pretty much even all the way throughout. Now, Rob, whenever it comes to this contract that Blake Jarwin ended up getting from the Dallas Cowboys and a a little bit of a statement made to Jason Witten about, hey, we're going to move on from you. We're going to make Blake Jarwin our tight end number one. This is money that's not necessarily big time guaranteed money. However, it is something that just still puts that statement out there saying, hey, we're, we're making you the top guy here. Yeah, I think so. And, and like Heckman alluded to, I think he might have been in position to be the number one guy a year ago. Yeah. And when Witten came back, the way the front office kind of looked at it was, well, we can just kind of kick the can down the road a little bit and <laughs> evaluate him for another year and see how he does. And then if we need to go look for a tight end in the draft, if Witten moves on the next year, then, then we can do that. And obviously they liked what they saw. Isaiah made a good point. You know, I think the reliability part, We know what he can do after the catch. I mean, the guy's averaged Mm -hmm. almost 12 yards a a catch for his career, and he he can stretch the field, and he's a good run-after-catch guy, but that that reliability aspect is so key from the tight end Uh position. And Uh I I just go back to it, the the sample size, he's been in a certain role, you know, the first couple years. And there's a big difference when you're asked to take on another role and be more involved. I don't think he's had more than 50... I don't think he's had 50 targets in a season for his career. So now there's more asked of him. And Dak Prescott needs kind of that safety valve. And, and can he be that guy? That's got to be the question. Yeah, that's a, that's a great point. Also, uh, Rob, Rob, that safety net uh, for Dak Prescott is very important. And the, the load that you're putting on him. Look, here's the, the other part about it is this. And, and I think, Isaiah, you were, you're, you're kind of alluding to this also. And also, uh, Kyle, that, look, you, you have certain schemes. And if you're tempting your hand to say that, you know, Jarwin can't block and he's only in on pass plays, then, man, defense is just going to pin their ears back every time they see him come into the game. And so he has to be able to correct that. In this COVID-19 world that we're in, man, where people are, where these guys are not able to get those reps and get that experience right now, leading into a very important season yeah. for Jarwin. Um, but also, I think that it's, you're going to the explosion in the tight at the tight end position is going to be uh, owed to the receiving core that we have because, man, these guys are going to be able to find those little soft spots in the defense and just camp out. And if Dak needs to, if the play breaks down, Jarwin uh, or or Bell will be available. 
Well, Travis Kelsey proved last season that you can be a tight end in a high-powered offense. Maybe you're not the the featured piece of that offense every single game because from time to time it was Patrick Mahomes, Tyreek Hill. It was guys other than Travis Kelsey that led that Chiefs team to a Super Bowl win. Now, I'm not comparing Blake Jarwin to Travis Kelsey. (laughs) No, you didn't. No, you didn't. You didn't. Let's let's (laughs) pump the brakes there. (laughs) <laughs> but I do want to ask Isaiah, what is the what is the ceiling for Blake Jarwin? What kind of ceiling does this guy have? Because he was undrafted, <laughs> he's still got the frame, he's got the hands, he's got the vertical vertical threat ability. I want to know what his ceiling is. I mean, I think you just alluded to it, right? I mean, he has all the intangibles that you want. Um, I think what everybody's waiting to see is if he has that that tenacious um, attitude that that, that that get that dog in him that just wants to bury somebody in the, in the ground because he's going to have to find that, um, as we just talked about, right? I mean, you know, he went from coming in and relieving wit to now he's working with the offense alignment. Like, mm-hmm. that's what you do, right? So when those guys make an adjustment on the line because of a certain front that the defense presents, he needs to know everything that they need to know. He needs to be able to block the same people that they have to block, right? And then, oh, by the way, next play, I need you to run down the field, you know, 12 yards and, and find a, find a hole uh, so that you can get, you know, that can get you the ball. So I think the ceiling, you know, the ceiling is whatever, whatever he wants it to be. I mean, he has all the intangibles. I think most of the time, you know, somebody doesn't have the physical aspect of something and you're like, ah, oh, you know, maybe they can develop that, right? I think for this, it's a skill set in terms of he needs reps, Right, he needs run blocking reps. He needs pass blocking reps because he is going to be pass blocking as well. Um, but when you're paying somebody, you know, five six million a year, they they won't have to figure it out. Yeah. Heckman. No, I, I mean that's uh, that's absolutely correct, and, and I believe that that Jarwin has that. He has the ability, uh, or else the Cowboys wouldn't have have paid him. Uh, but at the mm. same time, I just feel as though. Look, as far as schemes, defenses that's coming against this offense, he's going to have to have all of those uh, intangibles. But I I think we're putting a lot more on Jarwin than we need to because they signed Blake Bell as well. And so I just just feel like it's not just going to be the Jarwin show. I I think that Blake Bell gives that the Cowboys offense that comfort zone with a big body guy that's also just as capable as Jarwin if he doesn't fill that role uh, in run blocking. You say it right, Isaiah, with 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 uh, Ezekiel Elliott, I'm about to say freaky Ezekiel. <laughs> with, Ezekiel <laughs> with, with Ezekiel Elliott, you know what the Cowboys want to do. They want to run the ball and they yep. want to be dominating uh, at running the ball and that has a lot to do with the tight end. So Jarwin is going to have a big responsibility uh, to get that done. But if he can't, guys, Blake Bell, that's what he does. He's all about that. And so, look, it's all about how you disguise it. It's all about the way that you roll it out so that the defense doesn't, you know, you don't tip your hand on what you're doing. But I think the Cowboys have the guys in that tight end room that can get it done. But, but hey, just following up on that, and, and Rob, you might have an opinion on this too. How much two tight ends, how many two tight end sets do you guys really expect to see? Because you're not you're not going to just totally remove, or, you know. Yeah, I want to go. I want to go eleven personnel as much as I can. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. yeah. <laughs> with number eight, with number eighty eight, the new eighty eight. You know, that's a yep. good point. Yep. So I mean, but I, regard- but I, go ahead, go ahead. Isaac. No, no, I was going to say, you know, regardless of the skill set of, of Blake, you know, I mean, he's he, yeah, he that's what he does. He blocks, but like when he comes in, he's coming in in a two tight end set. You're not taking right. your newly two or twenty plus million dollar man off the field. Right and putting in a guy that you just signed to to be the blocker. So when he comes in, it's gonna be a it's gonna be a two tight end set. It's gonna be two receivers. So uh, to your point, Rob, that's why I want to get your opinion. I know I know you want to see eighty eight out there. How how often do you think that's really gonna happen? Right. I mean, yeah, it's gonna happen probably five six times a game. I mean, uh, offenses are probably averaging about forty snaps a game. Yeah, I mean, I, I, you're probably right. There probably will be less twelve personnel than we've seen. From in the past, and it, it probably will come down to him being more just a well-rounded player. I, yep. Heck makes a good point. I mean, Blake Bell was signed to be more of that probably wit and roll, more of that utility guy in the line of scrimmage. Uh, but it's going to be interesting to see how they use both guys. I still think you've got to use Blake Jarwin's strengths at the end of the day. Find a way to get him in mismatch situations on a linebacker, things of that nature, where he can make plays for you down the field. Because I think I think he can still do that, but. To Isaiah's point, he's still got to be able to do some of the underneath stuff. The that dirty work. Did. And some <laughs> of the dirty work because that's a lot That's a lot of what the tight end has to do, Because you, have, especially when you have so many other weapons on yeah. the outside that you can go to. 
you've got plenty more weapons than you have had in the past, and it's because of all of the improvements that you've ended up having uh, this offseason on that offensive side of the ball. There's been that same kind of improvement on the defensive side, and we'll go back to the defense here in this fi- final segment. And we're talking specifically about the cornerback position, we're going to rank – Each of the 11 Dallas Cowboys corners, we're going to tell you why the name at the top of the list might not be the one that you expect when we come back here on Talking Cowboys. Since 1865, Stetson hats are American-made with pride right here in Texas. And Stetson is proud to be on the field with America's team. Want to show your Texas and team pride too? You can. By purchasing your own Stetson, you can look just like how the flag guys do on field at every home game. Stetson Hats, the official crown of all self-respecting Cowboys and your favorite football team. Get yours today in the Stadium Pro Shop or at Stetson.com. Your new apartment's big. Such a great deal. Uh, it's okay. Just okay? What's not too... Right above the subway! Well, I bet you don't even notice it after the... That's my neighbor, Angus! A deal that's just okay is not okay. Get a great deal with America's Best Network. Come into an AT&T store to find out how to get one of our popular smartphones for $0 down. Based on GWS1 score September 2019. Essilor is a proud sponsor of the Dallas Cowboys. Helping fans see more and do more with our best vision solutions. Our lens technologies reveal a world more beautiful than you can imagine. For a limited time, get the Essilor Next Gen offer. When you buy the latest generation of Transitions lenses with select Essilor lenses, you can choose a second pair of clear lenses for free with qualifying frame purchases. Restrictions apply. Find a participating eye care professional by visiting EssilorUSA.com. Essilor. See more. Do more. So, you're shopping. And that's when you see it. Aisle 23. Dr. Pepper stacked from top to bottom as far as the eye can see. The phrase too good to be true comes to mind, yet there it is. A rich, delicious Dr. Pepper paradise. Wait, did, did that can of Dr. Pepper just open itself for you? They all are. As if to say, so nice to treat you. And even though it feels weird to talk to a can, you pick one up and say, it's so nice to be treated. Dr. Pepper, so nice to treat you. Back to Talkin' Cowboys. Get the ultimate fan experience from the ultimate cow for the ultimate cowboy fan. Join Dallas Cowboys United and get an exclusive DCU fan pack and member benefits. Memberships start at only $20. Visit DallasCowboys.com slash United to join today. It's the first ever read for Heckma Harrison on Talking Love Cowboys. It. How about that? Love Love it. It. Knocking it out of the park. And we've always had a a fun analyst read (laughs) going into the third segment of this show. Uh, It's kind of a tradition on Talking Cowboys, so we're glad to bring that back. Final segment, though, here on this Tuesday morning. Heckma Harrison, Isaiah Stanback, our resident Super Bowl champion, and the great Rob Phillips. Hey, guys, how about a little bit of breaking news for you? How's that Mm. sound? Mm. Let's go. Just a little bit of Talking Cowboys breaking news. According to sources, and this is from Charles Robinson from Yahoo Sports, says NFL head coaches may return to facilities next week with mini camps to potentially follow in June. And if you go further down into that article, that is on Yahoo.com. It says scheduled as early as June 15th or as late as June 27th, mini camps, depending on COVID-19 data and whether the handful of franchises get a quote-unquote go-ahead signal from state governments to resume full operations. So, another hurdle, another big-time step moving forward toward the 2020 season and something that is encouraging to potentially having football back, which is huge. Now, this is from Yahoo Sports. Sources say it's all just a report. We have heard nothing from the Dallas Cowboys on our end of things in terms of when those dates would be or what that looks like for what's going on at the star in Frisco. But just wanted to give wow. you guys a little bit of encouraging news heading into I the I love that, segment. man. That is, that is good. As long as your source wasn't Chris Sims, we're good, man. <laughs> <laughs> good. Of course, Chris Sims oh, this man. past week uh, throwing out uh, some numbers about the Dak Prescott contract negotiation and numbers that weren't necessarily uh, – what we thought uh, were true, and so they ended up not being true. But uh, no. still interesting when it comes to that contract negotiation as well. But luckily, this was not from Chris Sims. Uh, it was from Yahoo Sports. Now, going into this final segment, I want to 
pull our attention to another website. Last segment, we talked about Blake Jarwin. There's a full interview up on DallasCowboys.com. Nick Eatman sat down with Blake Jarwin. You can go check that out in its entirety. He talks about Jason Witten, his new role. He talks about all things Dallas Cowboys with Nick Eatman, and it's a great interview. I I highly encourage it. Also on DallasCowboys.com, because we're just cranking out all sorts of content over the the offseason, a rank them, an early ranking of the Cowboys 11 corners, and that's what we're going to go into right now. The 11 corners for the Dallas Cowboys. I'm not going to go through all 11. We're going to start at number 8, and we're going to work our way through, and we're going to agree or disagree. Now, Rob, out of the four of us, was the only one that actually contributed to this article, so we're going to really Mm. get after Rob if we disagree (laughs) is the the point. Okay, Heckman and Isaiah, we're going to agree to disagree uh, with Rob Phillips. Now, starting at number 8, C.J. Goodwin is number 8. Number 7, Maurice Kennedy. Number six, the newly drafted Reggie Robinson, the second, fourth-round pick out of Tulsa. Number five, Daryl Worley, uh, an acquired free agent. And then at number four, Trayvon Diggs, the second-round draft pick out of Alabama. Number three, Anthony Brown. Number two, Cheeto Awuzie. And number one, this one surprised me, Rob, and I'm about to give you a chance to, to, to give, you some, uh, give you some of this positivity around this number one pick, but Jordan I why, Lewis... I wonder why was, it's unusual. It, it's a little bit unusual, but Jordan Lewis is the number one selection, and this is by the Cowboys staff, so the, the guys who have been around and know the team the most. Rob, tell me why Jordan Lewis was number one. Wait, you didn't like it, why? Because he's not 6'5", right? Not, <laughs> Maybe. Doesn't have super long arms and all that? <laughs> I, that like, might be something. I, full disclosure on this list, okay? This is all subject to change. We have no idea how this thing is going to shake out once the training camp hopefully gets started in the season. This is as wide open a position I can remember. And we actually got the idea for doing this because I was talking to Nick about we had a debate on this show a couple weeks ago about trying to figure out who's starting at corner. And, I mean, you could go a bunch of different directions uh, because Mm -hmm. they've got a nice mix of young guys and established veterans. And that's that's why we went – Kyle with Jordan Lewis at number one, just because of the fact that despite his size, and I know this is kind of the same trend as under the Chris Richard regime, he's not mm-hmm. six feet tall. He's not a long rangey corner, but in terms of guys that have been around and have been productive, he took advantage of his opportunities last year. And I think his experience, at least at this point, with no in-person workouts and everything, puts him in the top spot. But there's opportunity for other guys clearly to step up. They drafted two corners. So guys are going to have opportunity to win jobs. But we just felt like Lewis, what he did last year, and and being familiar with with this this franchise and being productive here, I think, carried the day. Rob, let me ask you this, man. Why didn't Jordan Lewis get uh, as many opportunities last season? I mean, everybody always speaks so highly about him. And what he does, it. I mean, is it just that he's an All Valley Ranch guy? Not, well, Frisco <laughs> guy. That I mean, he practices well. Uh, he's always aggressive in matchups. What is it about Jordan Lewis where everyone has such a great opinion about him, but it doesn't correlate to on-field performance? I mean, I, I think it was the size thing, really, with Chris Richard. Wow. Honestly, I I think um, you know he didn't fit that 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 mold yeah. necessarily. Yeah. Um, but I do think he earned Chris Richard's respect as the year went on, especially last year when Anthony Brown got hurt. And he just kept making plays to the point where they just decided we can't keep this guy off the field. Yeah. And, 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 you know, for the most part, he really did capitalize. on. He always just kind of seems to be around the football. So well, it'll be interesting, though, because, Isaiah, I know you've been talking about the coaching staff and what they can bring, and, and Al Harris seems to like those taller corners. So from a prototype, you know, I don't know if he fits ideally what they want to do. Nope, I agree, and I I, I don't want to jump the gun here because I have my list in terms of who I think is the top top dog or the top five. Well, let's, get it, let's get it well, on, let's let's Isaiah. Well, let's well, it. well dag on. nab it, let's go. All right, so <laughs> I'm a, I'm going to go. Should we start from the bottom up or should we start from the top down? Uh, top bottom down, up. why not? Okay, let's go top down. So I'm, I'm going to go ahead and tell you guys my number one. And I'm going with Daryl Worley. Wow. Mm, That's right. Yep, the new guy. And the reason being is because, number one, coming into this defense, they are surrounding this defense with veterans. 
right? This this defense is made up of vets. They brought in two vets on the interior. They're going to have two vets on the, on the outside at in. You have three vets at linebacker. You're going to – what's your name? Cheeto. I'm going to go ahead and take y'all – I don't know y'all talking about Cheeto. Cheeto is going to safety, all right? They're going to take Cheeto and Ha Ha, oh, put okay. those guys at safety. Those guys are going to be roaming free like crazy, all right? And they're going to start off with two dogs – at quarterback. So one is going to be Daryl Worley. The other one is going to be Diggs. Okay. They want those long guys that are going to put hands on people and not allow them to get a release and let the front seven do what they do. And if they do happen to get past those two dogs at corner, they will have to deal with Ha Ha and freaking Cheeto by the go out here to take heads off. Okay. And then in terms of the slot guy, I like I like Jordan Lewis or Brown. I'm not sure which one might might, might jump to the inside, but I think those guys would be the, the first the first nickelback uh, in, inserted into the game. Well, Whoa. that was a little bit of a curveball. <laughs> like that's it. why that's why this is great, man. Because you literally can go in like ten different directions with this thing. I love it. I love it. Yeah, I, I've always and, and me and Rob have had spirited debates about rookies and their impact on on defenses. You know, I, I just feel as though, as far as you know, Diggs is concerned, he's your top guy. And the yep. reason I say that is he has the skill set immediately to come in and make an impact. If you look at the season and who the Dallas Cowboys DBs are going to go against, my God, do they have their work cut out for them? Yeah, I buddy. mean. From Julio mm-hmm. Jones to Odell Beckham. I mean, guys, the list just goes on and on. So they are going to see some top-rated guys. Uh, Worley, I'm very impressed with as well. But, again, I just take Diggs, put him up on the pedestal, and make the list for everybody else. Uh, Jordan Lewis is my is my other guy. I love Jordan Lewis. I've always had a great opinion about him coming out of Michigan. He's a very aggressive guy, and I think he's a guy that Al Harris loves as well, just because if you turn on the tape, Feisty. like you say, the, the eye in the sky don't lie. You see the effort there, and he is yeah. a guy uh, that you know is going to give it 100%. I mean, it, it, the size of the fight and the dog and all those things that people say. I just feel like Jordan Lewis is one tough customer. Uh, Worley, three. Brown, four. Cheeto. And then the rest of the list that you have. All right? Uh, now, hey, <laughs> hey, hold on. Hold on, Hank. I'm about to cut you off, Hank. Hold on. Cut so me you're off. telling me, with the guys, you know, we tend to agree on a lot of things, Hank. But I'm going to have to disagree with you on this one right here. Awesome, you're telling man. me, You're telling me that you want to put the, 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 the new shoes, Diggs, on Odell Beckham, on Julio Jones, you gonna put him. To. That, that's how you gonna introduce him to the to the league. Is putting yeah, him not, man on man. Here's the thing. I'm not saying that he's Daryl Green, and I'm not saying that he's Deion <laughs> Sanders, right? But I, I will say this: that that kid right now. Uh, has been taking pro reps for a long time with his brother being an A-rated receiver in the league. Yeah. So I trust him and his mental right now to play in close proximity. Nobody plays man-to-man uh, with Julio Jones. I dare you. Nobody does. And so <laughs> he's going to have help. I mean, let's just keep it all the way real. Yeah. But Trayvon Diggs has the skill set right now. Now, I don't know much about I don't know Worley. I mean, I've done my homework on him. But as far as against the top-rated guys, I can look at Diggs right now and say, I know you're ready. You can give me what I need. And also Ooh. with Jordan Lewis on the other side. And so, yeah, let's get it on. No, man, there are no red shirt years in this thing, right? So we just got to take the top off and see what we got. Now, yeah. Isaiah, I, I do want to ask really quickly, it, these this list that you've brought up with Daryl yes. Worley and Trayvon Diggs up at the top, and you're, you're yes. saying, hey, these two are the top two guys. Have you talked to Al Harris? I know you guys are pretty close. Have you had conversations <laughs> with him about what he wants? Because I'm starting nah. to think you know something that we don't know. You know what? It's the power of the dreads. You know what I'm saying? Right? It's the uh, power power of the dreads, Kyle. You know, when you got the dreads, there's this dog. It's like it's like it's like I, Avatar. You just connected. You know what I mean? <laughs> uh, <laughs> no, no, man. I just, I mean, you just think about when you're in a position to be a, when you're a quarterback coach, right? When you're a secondary coach, you are going most of the time. You're going to try to resemble what worked for you, especially when you happen to be playing when you're now coaching. For somebody who coached you, right? So now you have you guys have an understanding of what worked for you in the past, back when you guys were winning, and now you're in a position to make decisions. You're gonna pick something that resembles most like what what you did before, right? It's just just like um, just like Rashard, he didn't like he didn't like some of these guys, right? Because he wasn't a Sherman, he wasn't a Browner, right? He wasn't those those type of bodies. So I I see myself going towards hey, number one, what do we need? We need a veteran out there that's gonna be controlled, calm, not panic. 
right, and understand the game. And then, matter of fact, you know, let, then let's put our top dog that we invested in out there on the you know on, on the defensive side of the ball, as far as corner. Let's put him out there so he can get his reps. We, we, we have some help behind him, right? But let's let's put those two long arm jokers out there to put hands on people, and then everybody else can rotate through. And I think Robinson is going to be rotating there as well, right? I think he's our fourth mm-hmm. our fourth guy that's going to come yeah. in. But I mean, how often are you seeing four wides in this league, except for probably Week One when we play against the doggone Rams? <laughs> right. Yeah, it's funny now, you mentioned Robinson. I talked to him. I talked to, not to him. I talked to uh, his position coach at Tulsa, Aaron Fletcher, and he talked about how much press coverage they played at Tulsa. They called it cat coverage, and they said he just really excelled yeah. at yep. it. And that that's a, a really underrated draft pick that might be able to yeah. And that's the thing with Agreed. the list that we did. It was kind of based on now. But I think those guys have every opportunity to rise up as it as it goes on. I did have one question for Isaiah though. If you if you move Cheeto to corner, I mean to safety, yeah, what do you do with Xavier Woods? Is he just a rotational mm-hmm. guy? Could he be a nickel guy for you like he was early in his career? What do you think? Like if they and under that scenario, what could they do? Yeah, no, that's a great question. That's a great question. I think that you want to have as competitive as a nickel corner as possible. You want that position to be competitive. You know your outside guys are going to be competitive. You have to, especially in this league now, you need that third guy to be dang near on that on that part of the field just as much as the, the outside corners are. So I think you throw him in the mix with, with, with Brown and them and, and let them fight it out. But I mean I mean this is a good problem to have. You have you have probably three three guys that are a lock to be there, right? Or probably four guys that are a lock to be there. Are you gonna you know, are you gonna carry five, six, how many guys are you gonna carry, right? And you gotta figure out Hey, let them go out there and compete. So this this is an awesome problem that the Cowboys have. This they haven't had this problem in a while. So, no. <laughs> yep. so uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing to seeing this battle once camp starts. And not and only that, you... the guys at the bottom, Goodwin and Maurice Kennedy, they're they're corners, but guy. but, I, but I, yeah, I think heck they're probably going to be valued for for John Fossil and helping in the in the coverage game too. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely, and and you see that, and the depth that we had, uh, we have Isaiah again. That's a good problem to have, but also we have to keep it real when it comes down to, you know, our, our DBs, linebackers. These are guys that typically put on another hat and play special teams for you as well. So that's going to be a lot of the deciding factor as far as absolutely. how you rank these guys. And and again, with the depth that depth, depth that we have, and guys that may potentially be moving to safety. There are a lot of guys that's going to be on the bubble. And so even yeah. these guys that you're ranking, they may not even make the team. Very true. Very true. It's a big, big question mark moving into the season. Now, I, I kind of want to tie together a couple points, one that Heckba made earlier in the segment, one that Isaiah made as well. When you're talking about the nickel, uh, that, that corner, or really slot corner, that needs to be an impact player pretty quickly on that yeah. defense, and I, I think Jordan Lewis is right up there. I think Cheeto's yeah. in that conversation. I would put Cheeto up at the top of the list, but I think Jordan Lewis is probably better covering in the slot. And you look at even some of the added talent in the NFC East over this offseason, Jalen Rager for the Philadelphia Eagles, that that's going to be a tough cover from anybody, the TCU wide receiver that was drafted uh, by Philadelphia. you got Golden Tate now in New York. You've got Terry McLaurin and what he did last year in Washington. There's plenty of those slot receivers that are going to put a a big-time question mark on who is covering those guys throughout the course of divisional play in the NFC East. I think Jordan Lewis, Cheeto Awuzie could both fill that role, and that's kind of – it at least puts a thumbs up for the list that was given by Rob Phillips in in the Cowboys overall, but I still think it's something that uh, you have to look at whenever you, you move forward with this defense, Rob. Yeah, I, I agree, and I think when it comes to the slot position, I would if they move Cheeto to safety, as Isaiah said, that that's interesting because if then who's who's starting opposite him? If it's and if Xavier Woods it can do that, I mean he's moved in and covered nickel on the nickel before. Um, mm-hmm. And Tony uh, Anthony Brown has done it. I I kind of like Jordan Lewis in that role just because I like him being around the football. He finds a way to be around the yeah. football. But the, the, the conclusion I just draw to this thing is that this thing is so wide, wide open. open. <clears throat> wide open, and you've got a lot of guys that can play a lot of different spots, too. There's mm-hmm. a, and that's exactly what they want. They want it in yep. the front seven, and they want it in their secondary. Guys, you can move around and play in different packages. Versatility is key. No, Rob, playmakers. 
Yeah, totally agree, man. That's the, and that's the awesome part about having all these athletes because I think I know we're trying to say, hey, this guy's going to play this position, this guy's going to play this position. I think sometimes you're going to have Cheeto playing in a slot. Sometimes you're going to have Woods in the back, you know, back there at safety. I think there's going to be a revolving door, and you're never, especially with our defensive coordinator, right? I mean, you don't know what the heck you're going to get with him. So, uh, you know, I think this is like I said, like we had attested to. This is a great problem to have, and and it's always awesome when you can put guys wherever, right? When you could just come out learn the entire defense, and your defensive coordinator is able to put you in positions and situations that make you the most successful and overall make the whole team successful. And we'll see what they do with Cheeto, but but yeah. I, I remember when he was his first camp with the Cowboys, they had him playing everywhere. They had him playing in the nickel. They had him playing safety. They, they just moved him around. Yeah. They ended up playing him at corner, but he can play pretty much anywhere you need him to, and he did that at Colorado too. Yeah. And to tie a bow on this whole thing uh, in terms of the corners and really our episode here of Talking Cowboys, I do want to make just notice that it's 2020 and we had an Avatar reference from Isaiah Sanders in the middle <laughs> I'm of the I'm waiting on it. I'm waiting on it. To close it back. He, we had an Avatar segment. Apparently, Al Harris actually chopped off the dreads, so maybe the I know. things kind of over with. It's, it's there. It's I'm there. Sorry to <laughs> let you know that one. But that is, that is going to do it here for Talking Cowboys. So glad you've been with us. Hope everybody had a safe and socially distant Memorial Day weekend. Hopefully the weather gets better uh, if you're in the Dallas-Fort Worth area because there's been nothing but rain here for the last couple of days. But that is going to do it for Heckma Harrison, for Rob Phillips, for the Super Bowl champion Isaiah Stanback. I'm Kyle Yeomans saying so long until next week here on Talking Cowboys. This has been a production of DallasCowboys.com and the Dallas Cowboys Football Club. How about this, Cowboys? Yeah!